In the Clockwork Orange's most pivotal scene, we see Alex strapped in a straitjacket, drugged to simulate the feeling of dying. His eyelids open, pride open, forced to watch footage of the worst human catastrophes ever recorded. The rapes, murders, and genocides. Upon this reformation, through this brainwashing technique called the Ludovico treatment, like a mouse in a scare box, Alex finds himself no longer a free actor. Alex has been conditioned only for the capacity to do good. The mere thought of doing harm unto others makes him feel a sort of terrible sickness. After the procedure, after the torture, he is guided like a dog onto a stage only to find that he is the performer. He finds that the scientists have hired an actor to beat Berate and force him to debase himself in front of a crowd. Alex, being conditioned, cannot strike back. During this debasement, the real reason for the reformation on Alex's psyche becomes clear, as this isn't a means to build a better society, but a better means in which to have control over a society. A voice rings out stating what we as audience members are unable to say. The boy has no real choice, has he? He ceases to be a wrongdoer. He ceases also to be a creature capable of moral choice. But this means nothing. The priest is quickly jeered off the stage and we never see him again. Nevertheless, here lies director Stanley Kubrick's and writer Anthony Burgess's thesis point. Even in defiance of stopping rapists and murderers and world wars, it is not worth sacrificing the freedom of the individual. That the freedom of the individual outweighs potential security of the whole. That if such a treatment was to be made available to stop criminality, man being an entity defined by their ability to choose should never have that fundamental right wavered. After the treatment, Alex finds that he's unable to do wrong. This much was planned, but the state so hyper-focused on creating man in their own image discarded man. Alex in the Clockwork Orange's many ironic twists attempts to leave captivity only to find himself a walking prisoner. After a series of meetings with those he did wrong that could only be seen as divine providence, none of which Alex can counter, Alex is driven to madness. At his wit's end, he chooses what is the only thing left to choose, and that is to end his life. Now, that's the surface level narrative, and all this stuff is important. The serums, the medical equipment, the eye droplets, and the inevitable lectures on the role of science on man's will. These ideas matter, and we will kind of discuss them, but this theme runs a bit deeper. To me, A Clockwork Orange is not so much interested in the theoretical and science fiction, but rather interested in criticizing existing power structures. A Clockwork Orange, like all great science fiction, uses tomorrow's technology to better understand the world of today. So the question of whether or not man should have free will, and if he is at risk of losing it, doesn't really interest me, and neither did probably Kubrick, but rather the question I believe the film is asking is what is the role of authority, the capitalist state, the church, and the police have over others? And if they do, where do we draw the line? A treatment to reform prisoners into mindless, choiceless zombies is a byproduct of other elements of that selfsame society that is also explored in A Clockwork Orange. And it's here we may find that the truth may be stranger than fiction. The title is an excellent place to start. What is a clockwork orange? <laughs> clockwork orange, according to Anthony Burgess, writer of the original book, comes from the expression, as queer as a clockwork orange. Burgess heard the expression at the pub and attached it to one of his writing projects some years later, as you do. He tells us that a clockwork orange has the appearance of an organism lovely with color and juice, but is in fact only a clockwork toy to be wound up by God or the devil, or since this is increasingly replacing both, the almighty state. He uses a capital A for almighty and a capital S for state. This is important. Because oranges are symbols of something organic created under God, we see a lot of orange things in a clockwork orange. Now, if this orange symbol is to be paired with something mechanical, it would insinuate an altered, coerced 
actor. The same goes for eyes. Eyes are representative of perspective. Just for instance, you may have noticed these false eyelashes or the cufflinks on Alex's shirt. These cufflinks are switched out for mechanical handcuffs later on. Alternately, Alex's false eyelashes resemble a peeled up, cut up fleshy fruit, while the eyelid holders in the Ludovico treatment are mechanical and resemble swastikas. Organic juxtaposed with mechanical, state of nature juxtaposing the state. This is our first major motif, the organic actor and the mechanical altered being. All else falls in line here. Clockwork Orange is in response to 20th century totalitarianism, and this is why a Clockwork Orange endures as an allegory, not just as a movie that asks a lot of interesting questions. Clockwork Orange centers around concepts of human liberty, a state bureaucracy, a fascist banality of evil, and directly criticizes the so-called morality of those who claim to know better. It deconstructs the powerful and doesn't flinch to do the same with the powerless, even though they have the somewhat moral high ground. A Clockwork Orange is unflinching. This is why A Clockwork Orange resonates with me. With all its violence and depravity, the subject it seems to explore and condemn makes it a very moral movie. There are things I don't agree with, mainly some of its Catholic undertones brought forth by writer Anthony Burgess, but its main message is true. Make no mistake, A Clockwork Orange, although it examines authoritarianism, vehemently condemns authoritarianism. Even when we see Alex hypnotized off the evils of tyranny, the process to do so is tyranny. The film itself makes this distinction by showing Nazi troops jumping out of planes in uniformity like lemmings. A good question to ask is if Alex is being reformed from the evils of fascism or being molded in the same qualities of fascism. According to critic Roger Ebert, Stanley Kubrick's The Clockwork Orange is an ideological mess, a paranoid right-wing fantasy masquerading as an Orwellian warning. It pretends to oppose the police state and forced mind control, but all it does is celebrate the nastiness of its hero, Alex. Undoubtedly, it is stylized in its violence, but the violence is moral. When we see Alex nearly murdering a homeless man, you aren't supposed to sympathize with what he's doing. The homeless man is not coded as lower or lesser of a human. This is how we are first introduced to Alex and his gang, and Alex is in no way better depicted throughout the rest of the film. When Alex and his droogs are raping a woman, it cuts to a POV shot from the perspective of the tied up husband. Cooper casts you as the victim in this situation here. In certain scenes, I would suspect that you are in on the joke, but by no measure are you supposed to see these events as heroic. So before we dive in, let's take a major step back and clear up a major misconception. Mice don't actually like cheese. They'll eat anything, but mice are more prone to grains, fruits, and seeds. Mice aren't big into cheese, so if you want to motivate a mouse, give it a grape. Have you ever heard of a Skinner box? Well, that's one word for it. It can also be called an operant conditioning apparatus, but we are just going to call it a Skinner box. The Skinner box is a simple mechanism. It's just a mouse learning to get food after pushing a lever. It's a mechanism to alter behavior by positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement. Scientists have taught a lot of animals to do some pretty neat stuff like go through mazes or even play ping pong. The Skinner box was named after an actual scientist by the name of B.F. Skinner. Skinner saw this box as a revolutionary step forward for humanity. B.F. Skinner believed that we can apply conditioning to people that showed undesirable traits. Not just for mice and cages, but the idea is that one could bend humans to societal will. Skinner believed through social control, Desirable behavior can be elicited by the controlling of one's social environment. Now, this is just begging the question, who would be the reformers? Who would be the reformed? What method would be used to reform? 
What then didst thou in thy mind have? You've talked about the need for a technology of behavior. Yes, well, we certainly do need one. All the great problems today need a behavioral solution. How are we going to get people to stop breathing so much? Ah, I have a plan. And I should make clear that I don't mean the kind of thing that turned up in that movie, The Clockwork Orange, where you use uh, Pavlovian conditioning with shock therapy and so on. I'm not talking about that at all. But the behavior modification, which uses positive rewards. Although Skinner did believe the best course of action was that of positive conditioning, his optimism was at odds with Kubrick and Burgess, and I imagine most of those who were familiar with the terrors of the 20th century. The school of thought that a clockwork orange is challenging is called behaviorism. If there is a high school kiddo here writing a book report on a clockwork orange, add that to your paper. It will make your teacher a very happy teacher. Another major theme here is original sin. I might have to get a little bit biblical. Hang tight. Anthony Burgess was all over the place in his faith, but primarily the dude was a lapsed Catholic, but also a humanist. His agnosticism was a balancing act, however. At one point in time, he thought about converting to Islam. He ended his life in Manichae, an almost extinct religion that greatly inspired this guy named St. Augustine of Hippo. We will get to this hippo guy later. So while Burgess left the Roman Catholic Church when he was 16, the underlying Catholic moral dichotomy is almost always present in his works. You might recognize Burgess's Catholicism with its extreme goods and evils and its thematic interests in free will. To Burgess, there cannot be good without evil and evil without good. Now, The Wanting Seed is a terrible book. It's incredibly, weirdly homophobic, but at the same time, it's really helpful to understand Burgess and how he views man and the societies men occupy. Burgess outlines societies to go in cycles. First, he saw a society that has a lax position to everything. This is the Pella phase. The government tries to accommodate men the best it can through socialist reforms, but this doesn't help crime. This is because men are innately sinful. So this scares the people and then the state comes in and tries to perfect men better. This leads the state to become totalitarian. This is the second out of the three phases. This is called interface. The final phase, the Gus phase, is when the state is overthrown and things return to the original cycle. A clockwork orange takes place between the first and second parts of that cycle. So, what's the origin of these weird naming conventions? Welp, Burgess talked about these cycles in relation to Catholic theologians. And this is kind of important. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve chose, and therefore sin came with it. If one chooses, one must be able to choose good and bad, and this original sin would spread throughout the descendants of Eve. Back 1,600 years ago, people were still arguing about these things. One of these guys who were arguing this idea was St. Augustine of Hippo. He had his opponents to this original sin idea, one of which was Pelagius. Pelagius said, why would God give humans commandments if they are molded in a way that prevents them from being perfect actors? Pelagius said that men are pretty much good, that God is good and man was created by God, therefore man is good like God. But this dispute was quickly resolved when Hippo called Pelagius a heretic and threw him out of the church. According to Anthony Burgess, Pelagius never really died. He transmorphed into the ideals of liberalism. That liberalism molds institutions to mold men away from their original sin. And when it fails to produce the perfect man, the regime collapses and is succeeded by an authoritarian regime. To Burgess, the law and order problem is strictly tied to his faith. Burgess points out that men are innately sinful, and therefore they are impossible to perfect. But the citizen, fearful, and stateless liberty desires humanity to be perfected. 
and comes the liberals who use socialist policies but are ineffective in change because men can't be changed. Where I lived was with my dad and mum in municipal flat block 18A, linear north. The citizen wants utopic safety, but the state, no matter what, won't be able to achieve it. And from this framework, we have a clockwork oranges society, a pillow phase moving into interphase. At the beginning, it's a sort of democracy, but hanging on the thread. Perhaps a liberal quasi-democracy with major socialist reforms like housing blocks and state-owned land. However, rich people still own land, like the writer lives on a ranch with a whole bunch of land, and so does this cat lady. So there is a major wealth disparity. It's a mixed market economy. There are some questions, however. If there's so much public housing, why are there so many homeless people? I'm chalking it up to corruption or perhaps bureaucracy. Again, wealth disparity is a huge part of it. Bureaucracy is a huge element in A Clockwork Orange, especially during the prison transfer scene. The first half of A Clockwork Orange has everything in disrepair. Everybody is on drugs. They take these drugs from the Corova milk bar. In the book, Alex tells us that the milk from the milk bar becomes prohibited once the new party steps in. The real question is, what is in that milk? Like, drug-wise. Well, the ingredients are in slang. The slang is called NADSAT. It's a slang that takes Russian words and makes them sound English. Like, for example, we were mutilating a homeless person, real horror show-like. The word horror show is taken from the Russian horror show. In Russian, this means good. So it arrives to us as a violent play on words. But for the milk, they serve up three types. One which translates to speed, which is amphetamines, which is meth. Adrenochrome, which is oxygenized adrenaline and mescaline, which is a kind of like LSD. While Alex is in prison, it seems that a right-wing government was voted in, and a major tension of reform is crime. That's why Alex is so important to this guy. His job is on the line, and his neck, you know, it might be too. So if I was to put a clockwork orange on a political spectrum, at the beginning of the runtime is a leftist status government where 17 year olds are free to do drugs, but the jails are uh, authoritarian. So stupid libertarian with the drugs, but authoritarian with the prison. At the end of the runtime, right wing authoritarian. And yes, Alex and his gang are supposed to be 17. So uh, right, right? Also, heads up, and this is going to be sacrilege to the Kubrick files in the audience. To me, it's hard to tell the difference between the book and the movie thematically and symbolically. While I think it's Kubrick's vision, it's most definitely Burgess's story. It's the same story and seems to convey the same message, symbols, and themes. Being that the script doesn't delineate from the book and Kubrick and the actors took the book on set with them, off in place of a script, it makes sense that we give majority authorship to Burgess. According to Kubrick, my contribution to the story consisted of writing the screenplay. This was principally a matter of selection and editing. Though I did invent a few useful narrative ideas and reshaped some of the scenes. However, in general, these contributions merely clarified what was already in the novel, such as the cat lady telephoning the police, which explains why the police appear at the end of that scene. In the novel, it occurs to Alex that she may have called them, but this is the sort of thing that you can do in a novel and not in the screenplay. I was also rather pleased with the idea of singing in the rain as a means of Alexander identifying Alex, again towards the end of the film. In the earlier interview, Kubrick also states, A Clockwork Orange started with a finished story, and I was quite happy to skip the birth pains of developing an original narrative. There are many films I would say the director is the fundamental visionary of the work. I don't see it with A Clockwork Orange. I see it with almost all of his movies, not A Clockwork Orange. Sorry guys, but aside from the visual elements, what concerns us is Burgess. So there is a lot of Christian stuff going on in the background. How the hell does this relate to Kubrick, an atheist? Well, not much. 
there are quite a few symbols surrounding God that I believe Kubrick seems to try to be somewhat true to the source material with. You know, Kubrick didn't believe in ghosts and directed a ghost movie, and wasn't a socialist and directed a socialist allegory. I'm Spartacus! 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 Like, Spartacus was legit written by a commie, and yes, there is karmic justice and karmic injustice in other projects, so I believe there may be God signifiers here. We have a little wiggle room. Kubrick's adaptation is almost identical. Although Kubrick is not religious, A Clockwork Orange is. What attracted Kubrick to the project was, of course, religious. In an interview with Andrew Bailey of Rolling Stone, Kubrick tells us one could almost say that it's kind of the book you have to look hard to find a reason not to do. It has everything, great ideas, a great plot, external action, interesting side characters, and one of the most unique leading characters I've ever encountered in fiction, Alex. The only character comparable to Alex is Richard III. Like, if you don't believe that there's no religious moral subtext in A Clockwork Orange because Kubrick was an atheist, I don't know what to tell you. Because the central theme is free will, and that's a snake. And if that's not a signifier of original sin, I don't know what is. So yes, the cracking of lightning, as if to signal the anger of God when Alex meets the writer, could be a signifier. The writer reaffirms this by saying that this is divine providence. Yes, sir. A victim, sir. And by God, you've been sent here by providence. But the most blatant one is the most important one. This large stone bearded old man staring at free actors on the stage. And here we can understand where Roger Ebert might have gotten confused and why Kubrick directed A Clockwork Orange to look the way it looks. To communicate free will and the control thereof in A Clockwork Orange, Kubrick uses descending lights, similar to spotlights. Why spotlights? Stages have spotlights, and once you know it, performers perform on stages. This is thematic. The main theme is that actors should have the ability to choose, but are guided like a poor player on the stage. And this is what people got wrong when they got mad about the stylized violence of the film. It is stylized because it's a performance. These performances are accompanied with their own orchestras, singing, dancing, and stages. Kubrick doesn't celebrate rape, the goal of the scene was to illustrate Alex as a free actor under God and to analyze what it means to be human. These lights also seem to represent a watchful eye of authoritarian control, like a guard tower or a panopticon of sorts. The lights come from a fixed point of view and descend downward like a triangle, a symbol of hierarchy. Triangles as hierarchies are more common than you'd think. If you type in hierarchy in Google, we get pictures of triangles. It's a signifier throughout all cultures. It's almost universal. We see this heightened power signifier in many scenes where powerful entities exert control over others. This is used prominently in A Clockwork Orange's cinematography. Now, I have to talk about one point perspective and why it matters and why Kubrick uses it. One point perspective is visual shorthand for the dynamics of power in the scene. It's just the language of the film. Our eyes are drawn to the center of the screen because everything leads to it. Like, here's an example. Where are your eyes in this shot? Is it with Lil Danny Torrance, or is it with these two girls? Ask yourself, who has the power in this shot? Is it Lil Danny in power, or is it the girls asking to play with him? In A Clockwork Orange, we have this visual image of power often accompanied by people guiding a person or descending from a vantage point to a position lower or a level of another person. When things are ordered, it brings to mind a rigid power structure. Hi, hi, hi there. Well, hello. When things are disordered, 
we are shown through the visual language of the film a imbalance of power. When the droogs await Alex in the lobby, we can already tell that something is not right. This absence of structured one-point perspective in favor of a lopsided triangle makes us unwary. Alex's position of power is under threat, but note how these droogs are kind of cradled up in their chairs and, and Alex is standing and is the largest person in the frame. When Kubrick uses stylistic tricks, he's using it for good reason. The man was a pretty smart cookie. There are so many examples of this throughout his entire career. We can be here all day, but I want to touch on just one that sticks out to me. Here is our first introduction to the Droogs and who they are. And immediately, we understand everything we need to know. The Droogs not only operate in the shadows, they are the shadows. They cast almost a supernatural shadowy aura around them. Upon first glance, we don't even recognize that they are quite small in the frame because their shadows are so large. Because they are the largest in the frame, they are the most powerful. Doubly so because they are in the center of the frame, which guides our attention to them. From behind them, they are spotlighted. To me, this spotlight almost looks like a lighthouse, a symbol that will echo later on when Alex comes home from prison. Here we hear the song, I Wanna Marry a Lighthouse Keeper, a song by Erica Egan. I can't play it here, however, I'll give you the link in the description down below. So this is an important metaphor, because lighthouses guide ships at night. Uh, the music states, I'll polish his lamp by the light of day, so ships at night can find their way. This all-seeing lighthouse is a symbol of control. If Alex is the ship, then the Ludovico treatment is the lighthouse guiding him. The omnipresent, all-seeing eye is shown to us at the very beginning as Alex gazes down the Corova Milk Bar. This shows his power among his rival street gangs. This is also made visual to us with lighthouse signifiers that cast down like spotlights on the stage that Alex is made to perform on. Both the shots of the milk bar and the stage conveys power. The framing of the stage also reminds us of another exchange of power, the assault on the homeless man. The stage is different though. Alex is the victim under the boot heel as opposed to the dominator. A lighthouse is kinda a phallic image to me. It makes sense. Power in the eyes of Kubrick seems to be psychosexual. Alex here is impotent. We see as much in the performance. The impotence is shown to us again metaphorically, this time by the killing of his pet snake Basil, who died in a terrible accident. Oh no. Away. The most blatant stage is that of Billy Boys. Here we find him performing under God, a rape. The lyrics from O to Joy come to mind. World, do you know your creator? Seek him in the heavens. Above the stars must he dwell. While the slang that Alex speaks is always dressed with a sort of Shakespearean riffraff, the use of Shakespearean like thou's and thy's are pretty blatant here, giving it a showmanship like quality. Bottle of cheap. Come and get one in the yarbles, you eunuch jelly thou. The violence here is also pretty extraordinary, accompanied with orchestral flourishes. The name Billy here may also remind one of Billy Shakes, who is something that you might see up on a stage, so this too may fall under a free will motif. Billy, who dresses up like a Nazi pilot, is free to walk off the stage, which contrasts the films that Alex is made to watch of Nazi pilots, which are pre-recorded. The rape on the stage reminds us of free actors under God, as opposed to the pre-recorded cinema, which reminds us of Alex's preordained clockwork mentality. A fun little easter egg is that Alex enters the scene by breaking a milk bottle. The fight allows Billy Boy's victim to get away and to call the police. And after fighting Billy and his boys, Alex alerts his droogs to the police. 
The trauma from the beating leaves Billy Boy and his gang to be arrested. This foreshadows the scene with the cat lady phoning the police. Later on, Alex makes his entrance alerting his droogs to the police, whereupon the droogs break a milk bottle with his face. The droogs leave Alex to be arrested, much like how they did with Billy Boy. So why does Kubrick use the Ninth Symphony in a clockwork orange? Well, it emphasizes choice, or rather, joy. Joy is the daughter of heaven in the poem, Ode to Joy. God gave us joy, and the song is a ode to brotherhood under God. Joy is what drives us. We are driven by that will, that freedom that God gave us. All creatures drink of joy at nature's breast. All the just, all the evil, follow her trail of roses. Ecstasy was given to the worm, and the cherub stands before God. And here we see the dichotomy that caused Kubrick to most likely choose this music. Choice. Alex finds joy in rape and ultra-violence. Alex has the sun in his heart. He guides his own path in that stormy weather. Just singing in the rain. What a glorious feeling. Beethoven was used by the Soviets and many other authoritarian regimes and liberation fronts. It's here paired with the Nazis, who used it most infamously. Nazis. I hate these guys. The Nazis took a song about equality and brotherhood under God and used it to rattle their base with calls for national identity and to convey political strength. The result led to a piece of propaganda reappropriating brotherhood under God to fit the German ideal. When we hear the ninth during Alex's torture, we hear it mechanically. The song of choice has been altered into a clockwork style. According to Anthony Burgess, when Alex has the power of choice, he chooses only violence. But as his love for music shows, there are other areas of choice. Anthony Burgess was a writer of music as much as a writer of fiction. Burgess stated candidly that I wish people would think of me as a musician who writes novels instead of a novelist who writes music on the side. I still regard uh, the writing of fiction is a kind of substitute for the writing of symphonies. But uh, I tend to approach the, the novel as one would approach uh, the work of music. One doesn't have the agony of ruling the bar lines and uh, penciling in the notes, but uh, one has the necessity of discovering certain motifs which reappear, which can be developed, uh, certain uh, auditory puns which are analogous to music. But uh, at the end, I discover that I am a, more of a composer manqué than a genuine writer. His books are immensely musical, structured beautifully in their little Liet motifs. Kubrick follows the same formula with his film, with the use of color and camera work to accentuate these choruses. Music is a symbol of our humanity, and humans are sinful, well, at least to Burgess. Music always accompanies violent acts, for instance. Alex complains about the singing of the homeless man, which leads him to beat him up. One thing I could never stand was to see a filthy, dirty old drunky howling away at the filthy songs of his fathers. Beethoven accompanies Dim's beating, and classical music comes from a window, which inspires Alex to subordinate Dim and Georgie. Beethoven's Ode to Joy speaks of creation, which is instrumental to sin. When Alex is unable to sin, Alex is emasculated and can't listen to the boastful sounds of Beethoven. One could reason that this classical music is in line with Alex's libido. Music is often paired with orgasms. When Alex sits and listens to Beethoven, it appears as if he is masturbating. This is reaffirmed by the explosion of a volcano that ends the scene. In the DVD commentary track by Malcolm McDowell, McDowell denies this, saying that he is taking off his boots. That very well might be but I think this shot is intended to communicate him pleasuring himself, nevertheless. This is why we see visions of violence, and Alex is a sadist after all. 
most infamously rape is paired with singing and dancing. We see the destruction of books in the Singing in the Rain performance by Alex, a symbol of higher man that Alex seeks to choose against. The reason for the choice of Singing in the Rain is that Gene Kelly expressed so much joy while performing it. Malcolm McDowell saw this as the embodiment of joy. Take this with a grain of salt, but the ode to joy that is the performance of Alex's Singing in the Rain may be in line with the ode to capital J joy in Beethoven's Ninth. The Singing in the Rain motif comes back later to heighten the dramatic irony of Alex's crying in the rain. The orgasm motif is not just for Alex, but it's also paired with Alex's foil. F. Alexander. The right. Once the writer hears Alex singing, he seems to have an exaggerated, almost kabuki expression that could be paired with a sexual climax of sorts. The same expression is shown later when he is torturing Alex. At the end of the movie, when Alex gets his sin back, a tall glass of orange juice stands erect in front of him as he climaxes. While thinking of raping a woman, and listening to O to Joy, once again pairing innate sin with music. Well, you're looking at uh, one of the very first eight track machines. We used it for switched on Bach, well tempered synthesizer, right through a uh, good half of Clockwork Orange. Is music still music when it's played by a computer? Well, that debate may last a while. Synthesizers are so commonplace now, but this was kind of the attitude back then. How could something be so fundamentally human be corrupted? What is music if not humanity distilled to its very essence? And what is this bleep blurp machine? You know that secret chord that David played to please the Lord? I doubt many religious people would say it was played on a computer. And I think the same philosophy is used by Kubrick in A Clockwork Orange to soundtrack Alex's drugged up society of dominance. The actors are mechanical and so is the music. Hello, Hal. <laughs> okay. You may not know what the hell this is, but I guarantee you have heard it before. This is a Moog synthesizer, consisting of separate modules and oscillators so that one can insert and patch out little cables in and out of different filters and generators to create music. Wendy Carlos matches organic, familiar sounds of classical melodies with computer bleeps and blurps of synthesizers. These synthesizers distort sounds which are commonly heard as rich and weighty and made to sound mechanical and unnatural. Carlos here creates an almost clockwork sensibility to this composition. The machine itself looks a bit like a device for torture, and the bleeps and blurps remind us of the burps and belches of the primitive man and I bet it did the same for Kubrick, signifying the corruption of man. Yep, so I'll hear that one sound. It's a very low sound. It's very bright. Sit up there. Well, do put your hand over your mouth, please. It's bloody revolting. Wendy Carlos would work with Kubrick on a variety of other films, most notably the sound design for The Shining. Her pioneering work for the Moog synthesizer made way for other artists, most notably, but not limited to, The Beatles, The Rolling Stones, The Doors, and The Grateful Dead. In a fair and just world, we would all know the name Wendy Carlos, but the world knowing her music is not too bad of a consolation prize. An eye for an eye, I say. As for the state jail, equal punishment for equal wrongdoing is the professed ideal of the prison, but never truly administrated. In reality, like the thugs that the system detains, the prison operates on a source of sadism. Kubrick points to the hypocrisy, showing that perceived justice by a victim is not justice at all, and justice systems are administrated only to suit the needs of those who want to have power over others. The Warden declares the maxim, an eye for an eye, I say, which is a philosophy that Clockwork Orange challenges us on. 
is equality in pain the ideal ethical standard that we should hold as just? Alex, in one of his most egregious crimes, gags a writer and alongside his three other droogs, rapes his wife in front of him, forcing him to watch. We learn later that the writer's wife died, her body weakened by the trauma that Alex put her through. Nevertheless, Kubrick frames the writer as almost as psychopathic as Alex, drugging Alex, torturing him, and driving Alex to take his life. In a world filled with hypocrisy, our humble narrator comes out most moral. Our anti-hero is sympathetic because unlike the church and the authoritarian government, we have faith that Alex would at least be honest about his intentions to stab us through the back. When it comes to Stanley Kubrick, the more his career goes on, the more absent morality is shown in his institutions. There are good moral actors in power in Dr. Strangelove. Of course, all of them are incompetent. Some people strive to do right in paths of glory. Take you. Yes, sir, if it's an example. You want one man will do as well as a hundred. The logical choice is the officer most responsible for the attack. I'm not, Colonel. I think you're overwrought. This is not a question of officers. However, there is none in The Clockwork Orange. His final film centers around a sex cult that just may be the government. Knowing Stanley Kubrick and his cynicism, I wouldn't be surprised. When asked about who the villains and heroes are of A Clockwork Orange, Stanley Kubrick stated, well, you can't put it that way. It's a satire, which is to say that you hold up current vices and follies to ridicule. You pretend to say the opposite of the truth in order to destroy it. The only exception to this is the chaplain. He states the moral of the story, even though he's tried it out looking a bit like a buffoon. Prison chaplain is a hypocrite. Subtextually, the chaplain is secretly holding homosexual urges. I know of the urges that can trouble young men deprived of the society of women. However, he attempts to condition the inmates under threat of God and eternal hellfire to remain pure. The fact that he tells his congregation that he is seeing visions of hell is telling. It sounds like someone has a guilty conscience. In visions that there is a place darker than any prison. Are you there? Or have you ever been a homosexual? No, sir. Being gay, in reality, is something that is a natural thing. The chaplain is against the Ludovico treatment, but when it suits his views, he's all for conditioning. This is the major difference between the source material and Kubrick's version. Unlike Burgess's novel, in Kubrick's eyes, the church is also a conditioner. We can even compare the church's hierarchy to that of the Droog's hierarchy. Alex sees his lesser gang members as sheep, much like the church sees the congregation as sheep. Now they knew who was master and leader. Sheep, thought I. Later, Alex, while singing about his subservience to God, turns a projector in a clockwise manner. The state may be trying to get inmates right with God, especially with being gay, but the state is especially susceptible to sexually humiliating its inmates. Alex is inducted, unpersoned, and undressed. The prison official asks Alex if he is a homosexual while staring him down, hovering a phallic object near him. This, of course, is on purpose. Power is the objective. Rape is the tool. The first words we hear out of the prison chaplain's mouth are about rape. They were getting ready to perform a little of the old in-out, in-out on a weepy young divotchka they had there. Is it going to be in and out of institutions like this? Though more in than out for most of you. Or are you going to attend to the divine word? Often we see institutions seeing rape as just a simple punishment for those who did wrong. That it's not a flaw of the system, but a feature. As for whether Alex was ever raped in prison, it's up to interpretation, but it's heavily implied. Here, Kubrick examines this eye-for-an-eye theory in full. What is justice? Should 
thieves be stolen from? Should rapists be raped? Should murderers be murdered? Shut up, bleeding hole! Sir. Shut up, filthy hole, you scum! It is believed that you will be able to leave state custody in a little over a fortnight. I suppose that prospect pleases you. Answer when the governor asks you a question! Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. I've done my best here. I really have, sir. According to Anthony Burgess's 1992 book on the subject of language and languages, A Mouthful of Air, languages are made by the people for the people, and people must use language as their needs dictate. No academy has the monopoly of correctness. No dictator knows best. Language, as it is for all people who value freedom, was immensely important to Burgess's writing. Burgess even wrote the sequel to Orwell's science fiction classic, 1984, calling the sequel 1985. Both Orwell's and Burgess's book deal heavily with how authoritarianism minimizes language to limit the individual's ability to think. According to Stanley Kubrick, many people have praised the special language of the book, which is in itself a stunning conception, but I don't think sufficient praise has been given for what might be called, for want of a better phrase, the ordinary language, which is, of course, quite extraordinary. For example, when the minister says at the end of his speech to the press, But enough of words. Action speak louder than action now. Observe all. This one sentence is an example of Orwellian newspeak. The phrase, actions speak louder than words, is not spoken here because it would be redundant. By reducing and altering language, the state seeks to control thought. Language is vital to our understanding as this outward thing is used inwardly. Due to the minimization of language, one no longer has to think. They become like a clockwork toy to be wound up. This allows for better brainwashing, as there is no room for articulation, like a computer without the inputs to understand certain processes. How can one describe even the attributes of freedom if the state so strictly controls the way people describe things? If I take away words from your vocabulary, like independence, self-determination, liberty, deliverance, autonomy, individualism. How could you even comprehend such a feeling? It's like talking about the concept of colors to a blind person. If freedom is defined as slavery, then to be free is to be a slave. War becomes peace, ignorance becomes strength, which then becomes the tenets of the society of 1984. When I watch A Clockwork Orange, I watch it like I watch Frankenstein. I don't think that we can bring people back from the dead. I see it more allegory than literal. I don't think that people can be brainwashed by watching a movie screen. I don't believe in much of Skinner's ideas. I think Noam Chomsky pretty much disproved a lot of it. But I do believe that people can be coerced through other means. To best understand A Clockwork Orange is to understand Burgess, and to understand Burgess is to understand language. And George Orwell inspired Burgess greatly, and his thought seems to also have inspired Kubrick's politics. The inner monologue is a dangerous thing for the state. If one instructs language, one can instruct what a prisoner desires, wants, feels, loves, and hates. A prison even has the power to have the prisoner love their imprisonment. In George Orwell's 1984, the party would so completely demolish the recognizable human language that it would alter the very notion of what is reality. And from this moment, you will address all prison officers as sir. Nay, Alexander de Large, sir. In prison, Alex is told how to speak. Something like calling one sir is not out of a need to be respected. The prison guards know that the inmates have no respect for their captor, but by the time Alex leaves state control, he almost feels sad to go. 
And I felt a malanky bit sad having to say goodbye to the old Stager, as you always will when you leave a place you've, like, got used to. Doublespeak is the most common of these controls on language. What does it really mean when the government says, Soon we may be needing all our prison space for political offenders. The use of euphemistic or ambiguous language in order to disguise what one is actually saying is commonly used in the Western speaking world. Here in America, one no longer kills civilians. One commits collateral damage. When you hear the word collateral damage, you do not think of corpses or blood or bullets. You think of the concept of damage and a word preceding it. The word being collateral, which brings to mind, at least to me, a bank loan. Search and destroy. Uh, we have a new directive from MAF on this. In the future, in place of search and destroy, substitute the phrase sweep and clear. Sweep and clear. Got it? Got it. War is never war, but rather defense. Taking a glance at a newspaper, there is no soldiers in a war anymore. There may be boots on the ground, or freedom fighters, or peacemakers. A freedom fighter often is a right-wing militia member trying to overthrow an elected socialist regime and replace it with dictators, but they are freedom fighters nevertheless. And in the same vein, peacemakers always carry a gun. If you are a peacemaker, you don't shoot human beings. You don't fire on people. You neutralize enemy combatants. Well, it seems the NBA came in with a list of names. Government officials, Arvin officers, school teachers. They went around their houses real polite and asked for it the next day for political re-education. Everybody turned up, got shot. Some they buried alive. Actually, one no longer fights a war. One initiates the enemy and forced disarmament. One no longer even starts a war. One launches a preemptive strike. Let's be sensible about this. Sensible, sir? Listen to me, Dax. Get off this fancy talk with me, understand? Here in the U.S., one no longer tortures. The U.S. doesn't torture. The U.S. now uses enhanced interrogation. One no longer kills a person. One terminates, or rather, one neutralizes a target. One no longer assassinates a political leader. One operates in wet work. And if you just so happen to murder the wrong person, it's not murder, as it's just a casualty. Government torture, genocides, war crimes are labeled abuses. This is normally brought about by bad intelligence, but it's still intelligence because the CIA or the FBI or the NSA or the ICE or the DEA only communicate through intelligence and there's either good intelligence or bad intelligence not good information and bad information there's only intelligence if we move Vietnamese they are evacuees if they come to us to be evacuated they are refugees I'll make a note of it sir do you understand, Alex? Do I make myself clear? On the opposite side of the spectrum is NADSAT, which is the dialect Alex and his gang speaks. NADSAT comes from two regimes, Western English Cockney and a Russian dialect. The language is hard to understand and juxtaposes greatly from the language of the state. NADSAT translates roughly to teen speak. Anthony Burgess wanted a slang dialect to distinguish the novel, but found that just using teen speak of the day would drastically age the novel. Instead, he opted to create a fictionalized language that would never go out of date. The importance of language can never be understated. While the state seeks to control language, Alex and his droogs occupy a state of nature. Much of NADSAT is in Russian. So, what is the Russian's influence on the world of A Clockwork Orange? Well, I'm sorry to tell you, I have no clue. It's not explained. All we need to know is that Alex speaks it in his slang. We'll just speculate that there is an influx of immigrants from Russia, or maybe Britain is now an ally to Russia. Perhaps the socialist policies were a byproduct of the USSR winning the Cold War. Doesn't matter. 
What does matter is that the language from one society has been reappropriated and is used freely of state control. Power signifiers in a clockwork orange revolve around phallic objects. The most prominent signifier seems to be Alex's cane. A cane he uses as a weapon and which hides a knife, an object used for penetrating. The masks that Alex wears during his night escapades are most likely modeled after René Marguerite Le Famine. The same painting also inspired David Lynch, also a huge Marguerite fan. Alex's long nose reminds us of his deceitful nature, and like Pinocchio, the free-willed deceitful Alex has no strings to tie him down. The almighty phallus is a symbol of control. When we see someone losing control, whether it be schoolboy or adult man, they seek to castrate their opponent. This grabbing for the crotch in terms of utility is a motion that simultaneously empowers the assaulter and castrates the victim. What we got here is some major castration anxiety. Those in power are anxious of having their power erased, hence the almost knee-jerk reaction. We see this power signifier with Mr. Deltoid. A deltoid is a shoulder. Mr. Deltoid being a social worker is supposed to be a shoulder to cry on, but only really acts as a muscle, a thing of force. Deltoid smacks him in the crotch to convey power over him. Chances are he doesn't care about our boy Alex. Alex's actions might just get him demoted, so he's doing what institutions always do in the Clockwork Orange, castrates its victim, and empowers itself. Most of the people in power are male in A Clockwork Orange. The women in this dystopia really only have the roles of decoration or rape victims. This is not to say that A Clockwork Orange views women this way, but rather this is how Alex's society treats women and therefore how Alex is prone to look at women. This could be why Alex uses rape as a weapon. The state seeks to control through sexual violence, and the society treats women like furniture. Now, rape isn't about sex. Rape is actually about power. It's commonly a way to keep people in line. Check out this shot of you as the audience, as the writer, as the victim. Now check out this shot as Alex as the victim. Both POV shots, both victims both on the ground. This isn't the only rape subtext. During the Ludovico treatment, the drug is administrated into his rear. The drug is given to him without him knowing what's in it, without his consent. So, as you would imagine, phallic objects are also a symbol of virility. The milk bottles and tall glasses that prepare them for the night of rape and torturous violence is also rather phallic. This also goes for the writer's live-in boyfriend, or caretaker, or both, who sits behind a large wine bottle. This shows the power disparity between Alex and the man. What's opposite of phallic objects in the Clockwork Orange seems to be cats. Because cats are, well, you know. Alex is a creature who has the ability to choose, but chooses violence. Alex in the novel assaults a person with a bunch of library books and makes a point to destroy the books in front of him. The film omits this. The deleted scenes did include it. However, Kubrick ordered the deleted scenes to be burned. We do see Alex throw down the writer's books and do a little number on his desk. The symbolic intention seems to be that Alex occupies a state of lower man. He has no interest in books or schooling and instead finds interest in destruction. As Burgess puts it, to devastate is easier and more spectacular than to create. As Alex puts it, what I do, I do because I like to do. Alex views art from the perspective of a lower man, conflating Beethoven with violence, much like the Germans of World War II. The cat lady has similar paintings to Alex. Even the persons depicted in the paintings look almost the same, 
But these women are empowered. They are freely masturbating themselves and throwing men that look much like Alex against the wall. The shorthand communicates to the audience that the women in these paintings seek to undermine what Alex represents. Their masturbation is an individualistic act, and their combat towards the gangs that populate the streets might be an expression of liberation from patriarchy. Personally, I see her as Alex's foil, a person who is older than him and who stands in opposition to the chains that bond the statues in the Korova milk bar. Alex sees the cat lady's art as porn. The cat lady, on the other hand, sees art beyond the scope of what Alex sees. Art may be sexual, but she may see something more valuable in it. We are free agents with free perspective. As Anthony Burgess puts it, a perverse nature can be stimulated by anything. Any book can be used as a pornographic instrument, even a great work of literature if the mind that so uses it is off balance. In the fight between the cat lady and Alex, Alex picks up a phallic symbol, and the liberated female takes on the qualities of the higher man. She picks up a bust of Beethoven. This is again thematic. The conflict here is choice. And just like the apes of 2001, not yet truly evolved, Alex utilizes his tool, smashing her in the face. When he does so, we cut to her mouth agape, and then to painted mouths. So, the question remains, why does Alex choose violence? Is it just an innate sin? Well, personally, I think he has mommy issues. The drinking of milk may be representative of the oral stage of development. This could mean that Alex, the little sociopath, was neglected and undernourished as a child. At least, that's how Freud saw it. So, in turn, he hungers for a mother figure. What little we do see in Alex's life is a life where his parents are frequently absent. His parents also use drugs, most likely barbiturates. The fact that he can blast Beethoven in the middle of the night is a testament to this. This is more apparent in the novel. Their relationship is made of barriers, the irony being that he seeks out mother figures by lying to them through a door and asking to use a phone. Well, I suppose you better let him in. Phones are symbols of connection. The cat lady is a perfect representation of a mother figure, and this is probably why Alex is so desperate to get to the other side of her door. Alex is an empowered female, and this is something that Alex wants to counter. Alex wanting only a subjugated mother figure. It's past eight, Alex. You don't want to be late for school, son. The schoolboy scenario is echoed again upon Alex's first face-to-face -face meeting with the cat lady. I'm taking part in an international student's contest. This isn't the only example of Alex lusting after women quite a bit older than him. The woman at the milk bar seems to be a bit older than Alex's 17-year-old self. Note the visual language of these two shots, and yes, we can confirm that yes, our boy Alex has a bit of an edible complex. This shot is echoed again with the nurse who enters Alex's room and gives him a shot in the rear. Again, a symbolic rape, a reversal of the writer's wife. And to further the metaphor, Alex is made to watch rapes much like the writer. Alex finds his new parents, however, by that of the state. The happy ending is that he regresses into a child. Good. <laughs> Oh no, here comes the Pavlonian conditioning bell forcing me against my will to give you all a call to action and end this video. If you like this content, think about supporting me on Patreon so you could have your name in the credits. Or if you can't do that, why don't you hit that subscribe button and the like button to keep up with these projects. Now, I don't need to tell you how the YouTube works, but again, it's conditioning. I am unable to not talk about our Discord or my other videos that you might be interested in. They're on the screen now. Oh, golly shucks. Anyways, this is Frame Into Focus reminding you to... Um, Try the wine.